to kind of wrap up this session, we want to talk about landing pages, user profiles within the landing pages, and then just elements of really making your landing page pay off to this promise of the ad. So, you've done your keyword research, you've written out a killer ad, you have your keyword in your ad copy, somebody clicks on that ad, they go to, goes to the landing page, and said keyword is nowhere to be seen. Your conversion rate is going to stink. Anytime you have a keyword in an ad, you need to ha either have that, that keyword or the headline of the ad visible as one of the first things the user sees when they land on the new page. That's paying off on the promise you've given with that keyword and that ad, and that ad copy combination. Your best landing pages are going to pay off on the promise of the ad. In an ideal world, we'd be able to create 15 or 20 different landing pages per ad group and really make them nice and tight and marching in lockstep. Um, but most of us have other things to do like eat and sleep and we don't have time and our money to do that kind of uh, mass landing page creation. So you need to think about grouping your landing pages by campaign and having kind of a consistent set of messages for all the ads that point towards that landing page and consistent promises on the payoff. Um, your landing page also needs to be targeted towards where that keyword ad combination fits into your sales funnel. Is it awareness, is it consideration, is it purchase? It's a simple sales funnel, but it, it, it hits it pretty well. If it's awareness, you may not actually have a conversion per se, a lead form, but you may have a goal of getting them to read three pages or spend five minutes on the site. That can be your conversion for your landing page. But if you're going to want them to spend time on that page, you need to have given them something intriguing in the ad and the keyword copy to push them to the page. Um, your keyword placement and your, is, go, is vital. If you can get it in more than one place on the page, the headline, the call to action, maybe the secondary call to action below the fold, it's really going to improve your click-through rate. That being said, your landing page needs to be a well-written piece of copy. It can't be poorly written. If it's poorly written, it's going to per, per, perform poorly. So really think about, okay, I'm, I've taken the time and money to drive people here. I want to take the time and effort to create a good landing page. I want to write it well. I want to have people look at it. I want to test it a little. We're running landing page tests with one of our clients right now, and we will launch between four and eight landing pages, and we switch two things. We switch the call to action, and we switch the headline. Everything else is the same. And then we go back and we do the same thing and we'll switch graphic elements. With very controlled testing and really looking for the best combination of all the elements on the page that are going to match that particular campaign and keyword, that ad group and keyword combination that's driving to the page. So the point here is unity. Unity of promise and payoff, unity of language, and also having a very actionable, well-written landing page. And also, as you're looking at your ads and your keywords, just remember, a well-performing campaign is going to have keyword ad, ad combinations in different parts of the buying cycle and for different um, types of users. Um, also, your display campaigns are probably going to have a slightly different landing page because your offer has to be much more in the face when they come to, from a display ad. Again, it's the interruption, immediate payoff versus the well-qualified, engaged seeker giving them a payoff, but it doesn't have to be quite so much boom in your face. Um, generally, a short, sweet landing page is going to be more effective than a long, spelled out one. But if you're selling something that has a long, consultative sales process, 
and you may not actually be looking for that initial lead or sale on the landing page, sometimes you go with the longer, longer copy. I'm not a real big fan of landing pages where they're more than two scrolls long. If I have to scroll down more than two pages worth of scrolling, I think it's, it's an issue and it doesn't matter what you're selling. A lot of times, scroll down a page and a half, have a click to the next page, and that click's going to engage them a little more. It's also going to help you to understand what's working as far as the content. And if you know how the page is written, you can kind of say, okay, we didn't hook them well enough to click to the next page. What else can we do with this? Um, I mentioned this already, but you always want to be testing your copy, your copy, your call to actions, your graphics, your design. The more you test, the more effective you're going to be. Okay, um, any landing page is going to have one of four goals, and sometimes they can have more than that. Um, you can have your time on site information, general awareness, you can have your lead, and you can have your immediate sale. If you're looking for an immediate sale, having a second goal on the page, so, so sign up for an email list click here to find out more can be very helpful and you can get those people who are in, intrigued but not ready to commit yet but you want to build your page thinking one goal in mind secondary goals are nice but think one goal in mind to start start with um, as I mentioned we have different spots in the sales cycle um, the awareness exploration spot is going to be a different more educational landing page. Your desire is going to be more, let's hit the hot buttons. Let's start to talk about how I can solve your needs. We may not actually be asking for the sale, but we are going to say, learn more, find out more. And then your action. You can go with any one of a number of decision-based pricing trees. You have your best pricing, you have you, your close the sale with benefits, and you can also have a post-sale page where somebody has converted already and is looking for more information and you can do add-on sales. Whenever we create a uh, landing page or a set of landing pages for a client, we sit down and we create a persona for those different landing pages. And personas are not anything specific to PPC. They're a really good general marketing tool to help you to mentally understand and create the ideal customer. Um, one of our examples is um, selling one, one lab piece of lab equipment to a couple different personas. The first um, ideal customer is a guy who's an influencer. He doesn't actually make the buying decision, but he's an influencer. And his name's Bill, and he's slightly balding. He's a lab tech, he has a couple of kids. He's worried about getting home so he can coach soccer. He's worried about having what makes him happy with the analysis machine is something that's easy to use. It doesn't take a lot of extra work, and he can do repeatable steps. And then his boss, Susan, high-powered, empty nester, um, blonde hair, driven, is at the office before eight and after seven, does a lot of research on Sunday nights, listens to Bill, but she's not so much driven by the, oh, it's easy to use. She's driven by it can accomplish X number of analysis in Y time, it's low on the consumable use, it's going to help my team perform better. Susan's, Susan's, a, Susan's the driver, Bill's the worker. And we chose Susan and Bill because that was the profile that the customers came with. They said, it turns out that a lot of our lab managers and purchasing agents happen to be females, happen to be in the 50th range, and um, are at a point in their life where 
they're not worrying about getting kids off to summer camp. They're, the kids are in college or whatnot. Where the lab techs and junior people, much younger, much more in the family guy sort of uh, realm. So we created personas. We started writing ads, ad copy, and landing pages to meet those personas. We looked at the hot buttons for per those personas. And we would sit around the table and we would say, would Bill like this? Would Susan ignore this? And with Bill, it was like, and Susan was ignored. And it was, we had uh, actually a picture of Bill and a picture of Susan we got from Shutterstock. I mean, that's how far we took the personas. And the more kind of life and flesh you can put around these personas, the easier it's going to be to write ads, the more effective the ads are going to be, and the more valuable the effort you're putting in is going to be. Now, um, generally, you don't want more than three or four personas because then you start getting too segmented. Um, it's going to be Susan versus Susanna. And you start to get too segmented. And the effort you're putting in, the, uh, return, on, the return on your effort starts to diminish. So three or four personas. Try to match your personas to are they buyers or are they influencers? And then where are the, why, where are the different people in the buying cycle? Bill's going to be early on in the buying cycle, kind of a suggester. Susan's going to be the one making the decision. Hit Susan's hot buttons, hit Bill's hot buttons at the right time with the right ads, with the right pages. Um, now, in addition to personas, we're also aware that in an ideal world, we can build lots of web pages. But most of us don't live in an ideal world. Most of us live in a, we have a week to run, to create 15 different campaigns. And we might be able to build one or two web pages. And we need to work within the structure, within the restrictions we have, whether it's time, money, or design, or development efforts. So that's when being able to work with the text of the ad and the landing page is going to be effective. But as a rule, we're kind of stuck on this side of the equation and not so much with the, oh, we have time for a persona and we have time for a lot of different landing pages. We push to get that built into the contract whenever we sign on a new client. But um, a lot of time the client may not have the time or the resources to allow us to do it. Um, but something like a HubSpot or an Eloqua can really help with the multiple landing page creation p p quickly. Now, um, with the personas, we were talking some demographic information, male, female, mid-30s, uh, early 50s, kids at home, empty nesters. There are also psychographics. Um, Susan belongs to networking groups. Bill's a soccer coach. Um, Susan likes reading books about management. Bill likes reading books about fly fishing. The psychographics can be incredibly helpful. And you can pick those up from areas like LinkedIn and some of the, some of the Google Display Network has psychographic targeting involved. But being able to just kind of get a good understanding of who these people might be and targeting, creating the ads to really hit their hot buttons um, is incredibly useful. So one of the best guys I've seen on this is a guy named Marty Weintraub from a company called AimClear. And uh, go to SlideShare or go to any of the uh, local PPC and social media conferences. And he talks about psychographic and demographic targeting. He has a whole excellent um, slide deck he just released on writing um, compelling ad copy that stands out. Because you know, you're writing 50 ads a day or 50 ads a week. And it's hard to be unique and interesting. Marty gives you some tools to work around that, like brainstorming, thinking, think colors instead of uh, 
think colors instead of features. Come up with negatives, consequence space ads. Look for alliteration. All, he gives you all kinds of really great ideas on how to approach this. Um, with the personas, with the landing pages, you need to accept what you can control and what you can't. And that's one of the uh, more frustrating elements of any PPC campaign is there is limits on what you can create and you just need to find the sweet spot between your effort and the payoff and what you can actually accomplish. Okay. Um, now, as you get these landing pages built and you want to analyze performance, there's the ultimate measure of performance, conversion rate, and revenue. There's also the ability to look at the page um, and elements of the page via your web analytics package. Google has on-page analytics where you can say, okay, 15% of the people click here, 3% of the people looked here. You can do eye tracking and set up little um, codes that will track the mouse as it moves around the page. You can run it through survey and focus groups if you have the time. Talk to your customer support team. A lot of times they're the ones who bear the brunt of poor web design. Um, just ask United. I'm constantly complaining to their customer support team about their, their website. Um, and then there, there are some uh, tools out there where you can, Attention Wizard is one where you take a screenshot of your page, you upload it to Attention Wizard, and Attention Wizard gives you an interaction heat map, kind of doing their best guess based on their experience as to where the eye will travel and how long it will stay on various parts of the page. And it's, it's a good first step and it's fairly cheap. like. $30 a month for six or seven uh, screen grabs. And they use it as a loss leader for site tuners, which is the mother site. And they come in and they bring a whole team and um, they charge you lots of money, but they get you lots of payoff. Um, so as you're looking at your landing pages, a couple other things to think about as we uh, wrap this up. You can have a single page conversion or you can have multi-page and multi-visits conversion. Create your landing page so it matches the normal conversion path. So if you know it takes more than one page for a person to convert on the site, create your landing pages to play that up. But if you know somebody can come to the site and instantly be ready to convert, make your landing page a strong call to action by now. Um, As you're looking at your landing page, think, okay, what is my next step? Whether it's a single page or a multi-page conversion, what is my next step? And how am, I how am I going to make it believingly, blatantly obvious this is the next step? Having a call to action button above the fold is first. Having, having transition language, if you're having them read a multi-page article, a second, but have that next step very obviously spelled out. Don't make the person think. Um, if you have a site that really is historically a multi-page conversion, don't fall into the temptation of trying to slam all the language, all the offer into one page. Go with the multi-page step. Um, okay. What are we doing on time? Okay, so there are different types of landing pages out there. There's the retail-based landing page, and those fall into a couple of, uh, couple of different levels. You have your product slash detail page. It's going to be very much about the hero shop with the product, a strong call to action, immediate benefits for the user, and tying your ad copy into that page tightly. So if you're running a multi-thousand page site that's e-commerce, even if you're only doing a couple of pages and a couple of campaigns, 
odds are you're not going to be able to make the landing pages unique to the campaigns. So make the campaigns unique and match the landing pages. And this is specifically, especially true on e-commerce. So detail pages are great. You're, you're, have somebody who's ready to buy, ready to add it to the cart. Sometimes with an e-commerce site, you don't have that person. You might need to go at a, at a category level page. So in that case, draw them to the right category. Try to really think, okay, if somebody's looking for motorcycle helmets, what type of motorcycle helmet are they looking for? Is it for the street? Is it for off-road? Is it a racer helmet? Is it a cruiser helmet? And try to get them to the most specific category page on your site you can. And if you're not sure, test. Go to a couple different pages and see which one pays off. But really always remember, if you're trying to get them to a category page, say shop our large selection, browse our selection, look at, look at our offerings, and try to say, expectation, you're going to a page with a number of different choices versus go to the showy Diablo helmet, get free shipping, very specific. Um, with all e-commerce sites, keep the, de keep the clutter down. Benefits, a couple features, a couple trust symbols. So if you have a website you want to say, ver verified by VeriSign, something like that that says this site does not get hacked. Better, or better Business Bureau symbol, or if you have third-party certification of any time, get those trusted symbols somewhere on the page. It's going to really help your add to cart to the next step. And if possible, convert on the page where they don't have to add it to the cart and go through the shopping cart checkout, just um, buy now. And it's all on that one page. Doesn't always work that way, but it's, it's a nice, uh, nice thing. Also have secondary options there. We've talked about this, but um, save for later. Or sign up for our email list, sign up for our product catalog. Um, forms, um, i.e. leads, requests for contact. To get people to fill out forms, you need to trade off the value of what you're presenting with the value of the information and the amount of effort it's going to take to fill in the form. So if I'm giving somebody a one page white paper, I'm probably just going to ask for name, email address, and title. If I'm giving somebody a 30 page white paper or case study, I might be more interested in getting size of company, are you looking to buy, would you like us to contact. But the more I'm willing to offer them, the more I am I can ask for on the forum. Um, way, way back in the day in 98, I was working at a, um, a community website for baby boomers. And one of our, and I was doing client services and one of our, one of our advertisers wanted to uh, sell auto insurance. Hey, it makes sense. It was a good market fit, all that good stuff. And he said, we want them to fill out a, application for insurance online and we're like okay great and he gave us a 30 page form and we're like we don't think this will work and he's like well it works in all our other channels go with it and it took about six months to knock it down to three pages it was still longer than we wanted but we started to see performance at that point but the point being he was offering a auto insurance quote and he was asking all this incredibly personal information. And truth be known, his price point was not really that much lower than the average for the industry. So he wasn't giving payoff for the amount of form. Um, it is always good to say this information will be used only for this purpose and we will not share it with third parties or have a opt-out box saying please don't share this with third parties okay especially if you're selling something that's a little more personal any kind of health or financial information 
really take the time to put that language on there. Make people feel comfortable. Okay, final notes. Um, every time somebody clicks on an ad, um, looks at a keyword even if they don't click, goes through your website, converts or doesn't convert, every one of those pieces of information can help you understand your marketplace better and ref you can refine your campaigns, your ads, your landing pages. But to do that, you need to get in the habit of constantly looking at that data, constantly analyzing it, and not just analyzing it, but making plans based on what you see. And if you're not making plans based on the analysis, why are you taking time to do the analysis? But make that part and parcel of your daily or weekly approach to running a PPC campaign. If you're not doing that, you're leaving money on the table. Um, compet competitors are coming out more and more to compete in your same space. And you need to be smarter and harder working than they are. If you can only look at it once a week, look at it once a week. If you can only look at it once every other week, look at it once every other week. But get in that habit of analyzing and taking action. Um, this will also show you new audiences and users. Great example of this, the labware company we were working for, we saw a spike in something called a process control, which is basically a thermometer you can hook up to your computer, and it records the uh, temperature. And we had no idea why we saw this spike. And so we did some investigation when we saw the spike in sales. And we found out that a guy had said the Cole Palmer process control um, is excellent for doing homebrew and making your own beer. And he wrote a blog post. And the <laughs> post started off where he was talking about having a his little brewery blow up in the coke closet at home and how his wife was ready to divorce him if it ever happened again and then he said and i found this great process control at cole palmer and here's how i hooked it up and that got picked up and it went from selling one or two a month to selling 15 a month and we ran a couple of ads around it and a campaign around home brewing and went from 15 a month to 30 a month. And it's because we were paying attention and we were doing it on a regular basis. And we saw this blip in the data and we investigated and we took action. Um, it's, the data is gonna be there and it's gonna give you those, those little wins that will make your account much more effective. Um, use your targeting effectively. Um, again, looking at the data is going to help with this, but just logic, doing a logical extension of who your customer is and where they will be will allow you to have your ads appear in front of your customers and not in front of somebody who doesn't care.